Season 4 of Wild Cards found the posse out on the trail, exhausted and frustrated. They were traveling into Arizona and heading southwest toward the Sonoran Desert in search of any clue at all regarding the whereabouts of the Surgeon, the next of the lieutenants of the mysterious Baron that they were bent on taking down. They were also on the lookout for a wandering member of the Explorer's Society by the name of Virgil Price, as they had been told he might have some knowledge of how to defeat Chaos, the Reckoner who now walked the Earth. They found respite from the trail in the kindly community of Oasis Springs, run by the benevolent Dr. Ripley Titus. Rosaline in particular was in need of rest, troubled as she had been by evil dreams of late which kept her from sleep. But their relaxation was short-lived. The death of a mutilated man found wandering near the camp led them to the slipshod workshop of an insane little man who was clumsily experimenting on travelers. He himself had several steam augmentations, and he seemed to be attempting to emulate the work of the surgeon. Here at last was a sign that the posse were heading in the right direction. Down the road, in the settlement of Hanlon's outpost, the posse wandered into the middle of a dispute between the silent mercenary known as the Bandana Man and a gunslinger who was rumored to possess a shooting iron that glowed like hellfire, who had barricaded himself in an abandoned church. When a strange crimson mist descended on the settlement that evening, bringing the dead back to life and resisting the posse's attempts to destroy it, the gunslinger emerged from the church, his gun and eyes blazing scarlet light, and defeated the mist, but at a great physical cost. With his dying breaths, he bequeathed his gun, Life Drinker, to James Bogue. A bit further down the trail, the posse encountered a tragic pair of star-crossed lovers on the run from the girl's cannibal relatives. During this time, Howell was visited by a ghostly young girl, bearing a message from the sinister popcorn woman he had made an unwitting bargain with as a child. She would be collecting on her debt very soon. And in the aftermath of helping the pair, Gabe was struck with the sudden romantic notion to propose to Rosaline. Her emotional refusal left him devastated, but before he had even a moment to recover, he was abducted by some form of dark sorcery. All that was left behind was a note bearing a single word, Phoenix. Despite her continued exhaustion and sleep deprivation, Rosaline was insistent that they press on toward Phoenix to rescue Gabe. If there was any doubt that this was the work of the Blackwood Society from her past, it was dispelled when a handful of dark magicians trapped the posse, along with a macabre mad scientist by the name of Percy McPeters, in an abandoned fort infested with strange invisible demons. The posse prevailed, but had lost precious time, so Rosaline decided to split off from Howell and James to travel to Phoenix on Percy's undead powered vehicle in order to reach Gabriel as quickly as possible. With the posse split, Rosaline arrived in Phoenix and was tasked by the Blackwood Society with recovering a piece of stolen property for them if she ever hoped to see Gabriel again. She was told that in order to do so, she should follow the trail of grisly murders in the city, and in doing so, Rosaline became a person of interest in the similar investigation of one-eyed Texas Ranger Paul Femus. Once James and Howell arrived in town, a series of miscommunications and missed connections seemed like things were going to go catastrophically wrong for the posse, but they ended up reuniting just in time to work with the Texas Ranger and take down the hulking murderer who had been possessed by a cursed scalpel belonging to the Blackwood Society. Upon returning the item, the posse was confronted by Quentin O'Laughlin, Rosaline's old mentor and lover, who revealed that it was he who had been haunting her with evil dreams and sleepless nights. He revealed they had Gabriel, who was battered and beaten, but alive, and demanded that Rose return the strange ruby-like jewel she had stolen from the society years before. When she protested it had been lost in Coldwater Creek, Quentin severed two of Gabriel's fingers to ensure her honesty. The tense standoff erupted into battle, made worse by the arrival of the debtors Colt Holbrook and Johnny Carrington, who were intent on taking Gabriel back to chaos. The law also arrived on the scene, and just as the battle royale seemed it could get no wilder, chaos appeared in the form of a reanimated corpse and mercilessly eviscerated and flayed the remaining combatants, all while the posse was forced to watch. 
Lamenting that they had forgotten about him and had not returned to Colorado to witness his rise to power, chaos was interrupted by an explosion caused by an unknown mad scientist, which allowed the posse to escape in the confusion. After reuniting happily with Gabriel Pryor and explaining the events to the newly appointed Marshal of Phoenix as best they could, the posse discovered that this explosive scientist, one Gretchen Hexen, had been Virgil Price's bodyguard until very recently. She offered to tell them where Virgil had last been headed, if they helped her steal a cargo of ghost rock from an incoming train. But the train belonged to Wasatch Rail, and the posse had to contend with Darius Hellstrom's mechanical automatons, barely escaping with the cargo. Gretchen was somewhat conciliatory, and true to her word, she set the posse off after Virgil Price. And they found him, along with a whole mess of trouble in the form of a giant rattler by the name of Methuselah. Chased up onto a rocky plateau and trapped by the burrowing behemoth, the posse had time to speak with Virgil. He revealed that the Explorer Society was a front for a group known as the Twilight Legion, an ancient order dedicated to fighting against the rising darkness of the Reckoners. He told them of a book called the Black Codex that contained a ritual capable of summoning an entity known as the Black Judge. If bested in single combat, the Judge would reveal the weakness of any single being. Virgil had last heard the Codex was in the possession of Jebediah Nightlinger and his Circus of Oddities. The posse was finally able to escape Methuselah through the clever use of a cache of old dynamite they discovered, and bid Virgil farewell, but were almost immediately captured by a band of augmented mercenaries working for the Surgeon. They awoke some time later, in the Surgeon's horrific subterranean lab bound to tables while the eerily dispassionate woman explained that their activities had not gone unnoticed by the Baron, and that her men had been searching for the posse for some time. She left them to be prepped for some unwanted elective surgery, but that's where things got tricky. See, James had been learning a few things about Life Drinker during this time. The gun was no ordinary firearm. If allowed, it would siphon off his energy, or even his blood, to fuel powerful shots. But once drawn, the gun could not, under any circumstances, leave his hand without first taking a life. And as the surgeon's assistants bent to saw off his hand to remove the gun, Life Drinker twisted, destroying the buzzsaw and allowing the posse a chance to break free. As they fought to escape the facility, they found it full of other prisoners, many driven mad by the torturous procedures they had all undergone. They were able to free the prisoners and escape, only to be met with the surgeon's mechanized war machine, a gigantic mechanical spider. The battle was fearsome, and the posse very nearly lost their lives, but in the end, they were able to defeat the surgeon and her machine. She had left them with one final bit of information. The Baron would be in Yuma in two days' time, and he could not be stopped, and could not be killed. Of course now, they were left in a vast expanse of desert, with the surviving prisoners looking to them for guidance. Doggedly, they traveled through the desert until happening upon an eclectic group of natives that called themselves the Nameless Tribe, who offered reluctant aid. They also offered a time-worn box to Gabriel, but warned him not to open it until he arrived in Yuma, far away from their sacred cavern. Just as the posse were about to leave, the rumbling came again. You see, for some time now, they had been feeling a distant shaking in the earth, far off, but always drawing nearer, and only they seemed to be the ones who could feel it. But the wise woman of the Nameless Tribe felt it too, and screeched at them that they must leave this place. That evening, as they drew closer to Yuma, the posse finally encountered the Source, a herd of demonic cattle led by four hulking, mutated bull men, one for each of the posse. Los Diablos, the direct servants of the Reckoners, had come to put an end to their meddling. And though the posse fought valiantly, one by one, they were slaughtered and put down. But just as the Devil Bulls turned to leave, their purpose fulfilled. Chaos appeared. Blotting out the sky, he annihilated the Devil Bulls and stuffed the posse's screaming souls back into their broken bodies, booming a challenge to his Reckoner brothers and sisters. No one gets to break Chaos's toys but Chaos. Traumatized by being so violently resurrected, 
The posse clung to their last shred of purpose, making it to Yuma to confront the Baron. But broken as they were, could they hope to succeed? As they prepared themselves in Yuma, Gabriel and Rose opened the box from the Nameless Tribe and found within an ancient cross. A strange Spaniard by the name of Maldito Cortez appeared, telling Gabriel that this was La Cruz de los Justos, the Cross of the Righteous, and offered the couple a boon as thanks for freeing him. They chose to send him after word of Jebediah Nightlinger's location in order to locate the Black Codex and, just maybe, put an end to chaos. Then, wounded and broken as they were, the posse made a desperate gambit, bombing the railroad tracks just as the Baron's private train came through. And there he was, Baron Simone LaCroix, the man that James Bogue and the posse had hunted for so long, and with him was his last lieutenant, the Scorpion, a deadly quick and fearsome martial artist. The Baron had no clue who they were, it seemed that the Scorpion had largely been handling the business of dealing with the posse's actions against the Baron's Bayou Vermilion rail line. Once he realized their intentions, however, the Baron coldly baited James Bogue into shooting him. But even with the power of Life Drinker, Bogue was unable to so much as scratch him. Their resolve broken, the Baron left the posse there, defeated and demoralized. As they returned to Yuma, they were met with alarming news that was racing through the town. The entire territory of Colorado was gone. And so, after taking some time to nurse their wounds and recover their sanity, we rejoin the Wild Cards posse. What nightmares lie ahead? What hope do they have to stop the spread of chaos? Only one way to find out, friends. Let's saddle up.